Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. And welcome again to Game Changers Live. My name is Sergio Tijera. You can catch us each and every week on your favorite podcast channels, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, LinkedIn, YouTube, you name it. Thank you so much for your support because we're now a top 2% podcast in the world. And please be sure to go on YouTube and subscribe or Apple Podcasts and subscribe and share it with a friend. You can be a game changer in the in their lives. So today's guest is a very special guest. His name is Rakesh Jetley, and he's coming to us from Canada. He has over 30 years experience as a chief psychologist in the Royal Canadian Army. And with everything going on today, post-COVID, and now with Russia, mental health, PTSD, all these areas are on steroids at this point. We're all dealing with so many issues uh, because of, of different traumas, different things going on currently, and how to deal with them. Uh, the timing couldn't have been better. We're just talking about this. So welcome, Rakesh, to the show, my friend. Oh, very nice to join you. It's uh, the timing, you're right, couldn't have been planned better, but uh, it's very unfortunate things happening in the world. But hopefully we can have a meaningful discussion about them. So, you know, one of the things we, we, we talk about here is we have people on that are game changers that have been doing something really significant in their field, have impacted the lives of thousands and in your time uh, in, in the army and now serving as chief medical officer at Midas and Innovations Group, we had their CEO on Josh Barch back a few months ago. And let's, let's go back a bit. Let's give everyone a taste of what your experience has been like, because it has been extensive, international, profound, and um, I, I found that quite impressive. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, sure. I mean, I'm a physician, so I'm a, you know, interesting and sort of, sort of a Indian background, born, born in England, raised in Canada. So very typical in terms of what Canada is about and, and grew up with this understanding of psychological trauma. My parents had lived through what we called partition in in, in India, which was sort of our sort of mini genocide between Hindus, Muslims, and all this stuff. So I grew up with a real understanding of trauma, joined the military just because I was in medical school. It kind of sounded interesting. This this life at that time, Cold War was still on, which is ironic that we sort of thought it had ended, but maybe it didn't, and hoping to go to Germany and deploy. So I, I joined as a joined the military as a physician, as a, as a general physician, and I deployed to places like Rwanda, you know, where, where we just sort of, you know, saw a massacre of a million people being slaughtered, you know, really piqued my interest in trauma, wondering why people do what they do. I spent six or seven months in the Middle East, sort of looking at, you know, it's Syria, Lebanon and, and, and that region and really solidified my interest in psychological trauma. I joined, I became a psychiatrist at around 96 to 2000 and came out looking at sort of psychological trauma as sort of my, you know, sort of my grounding, and this is what we're going to do. Canada didn't have Vietnam, which I think is really important. So so we cut our teeth on these new new wars, sort of Rwanda, Somalia, the former Yugoslavia, things like that. And I came out of my training just as sort of 9-11 occurred and the, the Mideast conflicts in, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq and I was fortunate enough to deploy twice to Afghanistan and sort of lead a, lead a mental health team there. Um, so the journey has been incredible in terms of um, it's been a real privilege to work with the military. I think the military are incredibly um, loyal, dedicated, you know, salt of the earth people everywhere in the world. They just, you know, I mean, they're naive sometimes, but they really believe in what they do. And to be able to help them was a privilege. And I think what I did from a training perspective or understanding perspective, very few people are able to see psychologically traumatized people within hours of the trauma occurring, right? So, so that mm. was something that, you know, usually you'll see people a week later, a month later, a year later, they're having nightmares. So we were able to see people sort of acutely, you know, after a bomb blast or after something like that had occurred. And, and so what happened is, is from, a, from the, you know, the title, the game changing perspective, 
is is we started off with people sort of not believing in psychological trauma in the 90s. You know, when I deployed to Rwanda, we had no mental health support. It was kind of like, you've got your training, you should be fine. And I remember myself coming back from the mission with my buddy. Um, and we just basically landed in Ottawa and went across the border into Quebec and just basically got drunk for two or three days. I mean, there was no sort of understanding of, yeah. of this. And, and so as, they, you know, they gave ahead. you training as to how to help others, but not necessarily yeah. how you're going to help yourself. And that that's, that's you know, right. The I mean, they, and that in 2022, it sounds insane to think that because of the awareness. But I mean, that's the journey, though. The journey. And it wasn't is, that long ago. No, it wasn't. And and so what we what we did within within our military and and you know that we worked very closely with our allies, the Americans and the Brits and other countries, is understanding that what happens psychologically is an injury. And it is a legitimate injury. And, and so we called it operational stress injury, meaning just like you could bang your head and get a concussion, just like you could break your arm, you could have a psychological injury. So we tried to destigmatize it and create a paradigm where these are legitimate injuries. And so we did it within the medical world, but we had prominent leaders. We had generals, the general that was in charge of the Rwanda mission, Romeo Dallaire, actually came out as himself and said, I have PTSD from that mission. So so that journey in terms of destigmatizing and legitimizing these injuries was a really important part. Um, in Canada, we have a sacrifice medal, which is like our Purple Heart medal, and we do award it to people that have psychological injuries as well, right? So you come back from Rwanda, which, yeah. I mean, it's tough watching the movie Hotel mm -hmm. Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Having actually experienced that in person, yeah. Yeah. And you come back and, you know, you go to the bar, have some, have drinks for a couple of days just yeah. to try to disassociate yourself yeah. from what you just saw. Just to separate it, just to separate it. Right. And, yeah. And, and so in a way I was lucky. I mean, colleagues that served with me there, some have completed suicide. A lot have been ill. People developed issues. Um, you know, I, I think it's lucky that I didn't develop anything sort of a serious pathology. Um, you know, I didn't have kids at the time. I was still single. Maybe that was protective because I know a lot of people that had families had trouble seeing some of the things that they saw. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really sort of um, instilled in me an interest in understanding psychological trauma and its effects. You know, like who gets impacted, who doesn't get impacted, this, this kind of idea. Um, you know, I think things like that change a person. So I think it's, it's I don't tend to get too excited about smaller things, <laughs> mm -hmm. which means, you know, in, in family and in life, it, you lead to somebody that like doesn't do it. Some small problems compared to what well, you've seen. Small problems, <laughs> but also like, you know, you, you don't get too excited about birthdays or, you know, people graduating or things like, you know, it, it just changes your perspective on things. Oh, so, so either so way, either, either way, way, either way, yeah, whether either it's way. negative or positive. You're, yeah, and, exactly. and why does that happen? Well, I think it's I think it's just in, in the scope of what it almost like a circuit breaker in the scope of what you see after significant trauma, you just have to kind of you just temper it. And it's just the kind of, you know, and, and I remember people coming back mm. from Rwanda where, you know, you see people starving, not having food for a week. And then, and then your kids complain because the chicken mom made isn't good, right? Right, so, right. You know what I mean? Like it just kind of just changes your setting. Changes your setting when, when you realize sort of what kind of things people mm -hmm. deal with in parts of the world, and and you know, and and then you kind of see other people. I mean, people felt you know, I, not me personally, but I remember colleagues that had kids. They felt guilty at Christmas time yeah. because they're indulging their kids and their families. But look at what the people back in the war zone are experiencing. So it changes that setting. And that's a great point because in in the Western world, and if we're doing okay, it, like you said, it, it's hard to teach perspective by just telling somebody, hey, you yeah. should be grateful for yeah. the fact that you have a roof over your head and you have air conditioning. And you know, we start to sound like our parents did, right? And that's telling right. the same thing. How do we more effectively teach that that perspective, that gratitude. Well, I think without I mean, having to go yeah. through that. Well, right? I, I, I think I think one of the things that we do is I think in North America we're very insular, right? Like we tend to yeah. worry about what's happening in our community, our country, and and I think we don't often even realize Europe exists. Never mind 
Africa and Asia and things like this. So I, I think, so just, and again, maybe it's because of my experience, it's interesting, the question that you're asking, I've always told my kids to pay attention to other websites, watch, watch, look at, look at the BBC, look at Al Jazeera, look at other things and just, mm -hmm. just kind of be aware that there's a whole world out there. Right. And, and yeah. so my, my son's 14 and he was looking, he was doing a project at school and he chose to pick instead of the trucker convoy in Ottawa or something, you know, or COVID, he chose to pick uh, a, a terrorist attack in Somalia. Right? Mm -hmm. Sort of, to, I was presenting it to his class tomorrow on just, hey, I think this stuff is important as well. So I think yeah. it starts with awareness, you know, and and I think it's it's very easy to just not look that way and be unaware. So sure. I'm, I'm 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 optimistic in the sense I think education exposure is is helpful. Now, what's the difference between trauma, psychological trauma, and PTSD? That's an excellent question. So trauma is, is so something traumatic is something that can be sudden, um, overwhelming. Can it, It's kind of like something that in a physical sense, like a blast that sort of blows you away, pushes you back a little bit. And, and when you look at exposure to trauma, the types of things that can cause PTSD, if you lived in a city like Detroit, 100% of people have been exposed to traumas, right? I mean, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, coming up against a motor vehicle accident, a shooting, learning of somebody. But the vast majority of people exposed to trauma do not develop PTSD, right? Like 100% of soldiers in combat are exposed to trauma. Maybe 20, 30% of them develop PTSD. So post-traumatic stress mm. disorder is a very specific condition where that that traumatic event becomes over-consolidated, over-remembered. Normal memories sort of come in and fade. And then what happens is specifically, you start re-experiencing that trauma with nightmares, with flashbacks. Mm. You're just minding your own business. It starts coming through. It gets very, very distressing when you're reminded of the event. So then you start avoidance behavior. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to watch war movies anymore. I'm not going to see my friends that remind me of the mission. Or I'm not going to date because of what happened to me during that sexual assault, this kind of idea. And then you end up becoming hypervigilant, always on guard, looking for those reminders, right? So it's really that mm. re-experiencing avoidance and hyperarousal. So it's a clearly defined illness that probably exists about 8% just in regular U.S. society. That's probably a fair number. And certainly higher in people that are first responders, that are um, military, and, and, and people like that. So, so it really is this, and and it's just um, it eats up at people. And I think over years, learning it affects a person, but it affects their relationship, it affects their family, it affects their community. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, a a toxic thing that a trauma can that trauma can do, and whole communities can be traumatized. And you would say what you know? What percentage of mental illness is caused by some form of some form of trauma? Well, you know, again, I have a bias, but but I yeah. believe that most um, most mental illness that sort of we see in our clinics, trauma slash loss, trauma or loss, are probably at the root of most of them. Like when you look at um, people that have addiction problems, anxiety problems, things like that, mm. you know, whether it's a big T trauma or a loss, that's probably at the root of most of most mental, most mood and anxiety and substance use problems. I think that's where we're kind of headed in terms of our understanding now. Yeah. So you have to, you have to unpack, unpack and deal with some of these past things. You can't just superficially put a bandaid on everything. Wow. And so, you know, we talked about the timing, right? That the timing is 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 um, ideal for this episode to come out uh, soon. Here, uh, Russia just invaded Ukraine. What you know from your experience in all these all these kind of war torn areas, what they're experiencing there. What it, what are they going through? You know, the typical family that says, "Hey, yeah. why are we going through this?" Right, and and how do we deal with that? Yeah. Well, it's funny, um, um, ironic, funny, but about you know five or six years ago, a group of us from NATO actually held a meeting in Kiev. We were we were there exactly where some of the things are happening, and that meeting was we entitled it the Golden Hour. Like like, what do you do immediately when the trauma is happening? So that's like 
So they hosted us and, and some of my colleagues that were the hosts are actually there right now. We were emailing. Um, so, so what, so some of your colleagues are there right now. Yeah. The call is mean, happening. The, the Ukrainian colleagues that host, yeah. us, you know, and, and wow. uh, I'm hoping that one, I mean, they're hoping that they're safe, but the, so, so, you know, part of the issue, there's, there's a couple of issues. One is the, the whole anticipation, the lead up, right? Like we're kind of just looking up at CNN, there might be a running thing that Putin's saying this, this, but, but people have been living trying to raise their kids, trying to cook supper, trying to go shopping, trying to go work with that uncertainty. And quite often the trauma is your worst nightmare. So you continue right. to say, no, it's not going to happen. No, it might happen. No, it, you know, th this kind of idea. Yeah, just being right. in limbo there yeah, with that that's fear right. of... That's right. And and what happens is, is that for people in places like that, which we don't really fully understand is, that could be a whole lifetime for some people. It's 10 years. I mean, you know, we had previous incursions. We had the Crimea, you know. So, so what happens is you're always living this life of high stress, high cortisol. Yeah. It has physical toll. It causes sort of body aches. It causes disrupt sleep, you know, diet changes. You know, you might not look after yourself. You might drink more than you want to just, just because of that. And then and then so the shoe drops and then all of a sudden the actual trauma occurs you go into survival mode you start to so again the the, the fight flight sort of stress stress aroused kind of thing some people become hopeless and they freeze and they become numb and so so the the, the two extreme reaction reactions yeah. occur and i think you know yes you you it, it affects you but then a lot of times parents want to protect their their children. Children sometimes want to protect their parents. But then there's a whole community. And and I just think that, you know, uh, I've been thinking about sort of Rwanda, Rwanda, Somalia, Lebanon, places like that. You're going to, then we're going to face a refugee crisis, right? We're going to, we're going to see people that are going to be victimized, that are going to right. be homeless, that are going to be. So So I just think, I mean, it, it saddens me in 2022 that this is still possible. I mean, I, I'm not naive enough to believe it's not, but it's profoundly sad that this this actually does occur. And and again, trauma and loss. So you think about what it's going to do to the next generation that, you know, your neighborhood blows up or, you know, you you, you, you lose your parents and your best friends and then you're supposed to carry on and, and you know, live, live a life after that, right? So the, the mm -hmm. intergenerational impact of this is going to be profound as well. And in terms of, you know, self-care, right? Not only in, in that extreme example, but for, for people living regular lives, you know, talking about empathy, being you know having kindness yeah and uh and vulnerability tell me about that and yeah i think no i i no these are great great ideas it's interesting because with this pandemic that we've all been that we've all been facing and you know various degrees of restrictions but everybody in the world has been impacted you know from a from a coping mechanism perspective um it sounds my my, my former boss surgeon general um used to say hey if we get people to eat better, sleep better, and exercise more, half of what we see will be gone, right? So, mm. so I think some of those basic things that we take for granted, you know, and I mean, again, uh, Canada, we've been quite, quite restricted. We all went through our, you know, baking phases and eating poorly and then exercise. So it's been two years for us solid now. And, yeah. um, but I think ultimately, so that basic self-care that intuitively most people know, and I think the key ends up being is the the empathy and the and the kindness is to support each other, right? Like like mm. go out for a walk with someone, right. else, do do whatever you can. I think that basic because the one thing that is becoming more and more clear is mental illness isn't a brain thing versus a body thing. I mean, when you have depression, when you have PTSD, you have more physical problems, you have more gut problems, you have more Crohn's disease, you have more. You know, of all of all of these things and inflammation and all this so i think just basically using your energy trying to sleep better trying to eat better less alcohol less all of all of these things mm -hmm. i think that's really important i think the other thing is is just because you don't have that magic solution you don't have that um instant answer you can't fix something 
I think that basic kindness and empathy is is what needs to come out in times like this, where you just um, be there for somebody, listen to them. Maybe maybe it's even, you know, taking an older person, you know, do, doing shopping for them and dropping off mm-hmm. a basket of groceries or a thing, you know things like that. I think that that's kind of where um, societies are impacted by this, and it's a society that's going to help bring it together so i think that's i think those are really important principles that can easily get we're we're divided politically we're divided all kinds of different ways Mm -hmm. but but the commonality is everybody should be sort of you know i think if you look after the other person and the other person looks after someone else eventually somebody's going to help you as well right right and empathy you know not only for others but empathy for yourself and being you know forgive yourself if 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 you fall off the wagon, so to speak, yeah. and don't just say, "All right, throw your hands up." All right, I fell off. I'm I'm out. You know, that's right. It's uh, you know these small steps, right? And yeah. Yeah. sometimes, as life goes on, we find ourselves you know in in great places, and then before we know it, Absolutely. we're in a in yeah. a valley. And how do we start digging ourselves out of those yeah. holes? And 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 that's right. I mean, it's it's kind. I mean, when you the example for I mean, go back to a trauma example is that you know if somebody was sexually abused as a child, you know they're they're forty years old now, they're they're mad at that child for letting it happen, so they mm. can't they can't forgive themselves at five years old, and I'll often ask themselves, hey, if that was the kid across the street that was five, what would you say? I'd say they'd say they would say something. Like, Don't worry, honey. It wasn't your fault, right? So, so why can't you say that to yourself as a five year old, right? So, so mm. yeah, I think there is that kind of idea of of sort of empathy, kindness, and and forgiveness. I think I think with trauma and loss, I think acceptance and forgiveness is also extremely important as well because you're not going to move on if you're stuck back there. Right, right. Because you you carry that resentment with you, and yeah. by forgiving that person who who did the damage, you're not necessarily just forgiving them. You're doing it for yourself so that yeah. you could offload. You can, you can let go, yeah. So, so some of my practice, um, I I've I've treated women whose children have been murdered, right? Like very brutal kind of oh stuff. Oh my gosh! And every one of them has had to kind of forgive the perpetrator. Not in the sense of absolving them of their sins, that's up to God or whatever, mm-hmm. but more in a sense of if I don't, I'm going to wake up every morning consumed with this person, consumed with this person in jail, wishing bad things on the person. It's going to drag me down. So I need to move past it, right? And so mm-hmm. to move, moving past something involves a level of acceptance and and understanding and and sometimes yeah even forgiveness and i think that's the i think that's the way i mean you you listen you know victor frankl and surviving the holocaust you know while Mm. in the camps i mean you have to have hope you have to think that there's there's something out there there's people out there that care about you so i think these basic human um things that we tend to forget in this high-tech world of sort of empathy kindness forgiveness understanding um, probably are extremely important when we're over. You're not gonna, and not everybody's gonna have a shrink, and not everybody's gonna need medication. But we're gonna have to. Right. You know, we're gonna have to do this. And in you know less extreme examples, right? Just our our typical day to day activities and things that happen, you know, happen to us. And we tend to, as humans, we tend to focus on the negative. We we yeah. we devalue all the great things that we're doing. We don't take the time to celebrate our wins, e- right. you know, however small they are. Yeah. And. Um, you know that that's that's really really important to understand that you can decide to perceive anything the way you'd like to perceive it, and that's so right. per- perception is a choice. And yeah. so if you know there, that that old adage, right? It's not happening to me; it's happening for me. Yeah. I always say, find the golden nugget. You know, in there, there is a lesson in in the tragedy or in in the you know you got fired. All right, well. You know what? Maybe that was you don't see and, and, and why it happened. But maybe it's a good thing. So find out why. You know, take the lesson and 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 yeah. keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Stay curious. Yeah, exactly. Though I think it's, I think these are all good, re- really good things. And and I think the point is, as a population, if we're going to grow, there's going to have to be that self actualization and self realization. We can't always count on the other person to sort of fix it for mm-hmm. us. We can help we can help each other out once in a while if we raise our hands. But ultimately, yeah, it's your own your own perception of things that are gonna have to that are gonna have to sort of um you know be modified and understood, right? Why why yeah. am I doing this? 
So as, as we start to wrap this up, you're chief medical officer at Midas um, and yeah. this, uh, this organization is, is making some tremendous strides in, uh, the, the use of psychedelics for treatments of traumas and so forth. T let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. I mean, so to go back to sort of my story, so in, in early 2000s, you know, the military, the Canadian military started to build its trauma centers. I, I ran one of them in, in Halifax on the East Coast before coming to Ottawa, becoming the national lead. And what we did is we, had, we brought in all the best training, the best technology, medicines, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. And what happens is after four or five years, you kind of become the expert. And what people started to do about 2006, seven would come to me and say, well, sir, you know, we've tried the prolonged exposure, we've tried the EMDR, we've tried the medication, the person's still sick. So, so all of a sudden what happened is for me and, and most of my colleagues, the more senior people across NATO, we started to think about not the people that were sick in treatment, but the people that were staying sick and not getting better, right? Mm. And that's when I came up with the realization that, that the treatments we have are good, but they're not good enough. And, they, and not enough people respond. In fact, half over half the people that undergo the treatment of PTSD don't respond well to it, right? So it was quite... Mm. And so the last 10 years, you know, what I, what I started to do is think out of the box a little bit more, right? And, and you know, whether it's, whether it's virtual reality, whether it's, you know, data registries, whether it's, you know, MDMA, psilocybin, just the idea of, of are we going to get to a place where we have safe and effective treatment? So I'm, a, I'm not an evangelical for psychedelics i'm a scientist i you know they're molecules as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. molecules that touch receptors and that's the only that's the only reason that they work um i particularly like like the psychedelics because as we do more and more research we're showing there's actual brain changes that occur and and what i believe is is that that full dose so one of the things that people are scared of with, with magic mushrooms and, and psilocybin in the old days is this idea of ego loss and this loss of who you are. But if you think about it from a traumatized perspective, if your identity That's what you want. Is, yeah. is identified by that trauma, maybe the psychedelic is going to untangle that and allow us to work together in therapy. Remember, this is, this is medication-assisted psychotherapy. This isn't just take the pill and go away. And, and so maybe, yeah, maybe that ego loss, or that ego change gives us the opening that re cause regular therapy doesn't. Because soldiers are extremely well defended, right? They, they don't, like, psychologically defend. Mm -hmm. They don't want to let you in, right? They've got this tough guy persona, this kind of thing. Maybe the medication allows them to sort of let go of some of those guards and let the therapist in. So I'm very excited by... You know, by this PTSD trials, and and I mean, we're, you know, we're about to embark yeah. on on a smoking cessation study. There's been some really good work, in, in of course, PTSD with MDMA, alcohol use disorders. So I'm really hoping that these medicines, pardon the pun, are going to be a game changer, because because the the key ends up being medication assisted psychotherapy. It's short term. Hopefully, we'll have people getting better move on to the next patient there's a health equity piece where more people are able to access it so it's going to be a long process with regulatory bodies but i think we're really on the right track for this yeah it's interesting because uh, of the disassociated properties we we tend to i mean just as humans we tend to self-regulate to our belief level and to our identity yeah right we can say all right i'm going to go to the gym but in in your mind if you keep saying you know i'm a fat guy yeah you're always going to be a fat guy, right? And well, so, well, it, and if you're if you're sexually abused as a kid, I'm dirty, I'm bad, yeah, I'm not right. worthy, right? That becomes stick to that identity. Yeah. So, so how do we how do we cause that identity? You know, uncouple your yourself yeah. from that identity and kind of rewrite the script. Exactly. So yeah. So and that's see what I'm, that that's it can be rewritten. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's and that's what I I mean. I'm very very optimistic that that's the direction that we're going to go, but. We need to do it with safety. We need to do it with regular. We, we can't go outside the system. We need to go mainstream because right. the medical community isn't going to accept what we're doing without good, good controlled studies and show me the evidence. One anecdote isn't going to be the evidence needed for this. 
And that smoking cessation study is showing great results where people have just tried yeah. everything to stop smoking and this has actually started well, to work. The best treatments out there work. And again, as a physician, I, it's funny that you say that because you, you go to addiction centers and you to visit somebody. And as you're walking in the door outside in the parking lot, you see 30 people just smoke. Even the addiction centers don't deal with the smoking even though smoking kills more people than opiates right. than all the other other substances put together and so so the so the best treatments out there for smoking work maybe 20% of the time uh, the preliminary work out of Johns Hopkins and 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 Matt Johnson's team 60 70 80% after one or two doses of psilocybin and, and therapy. So again, I think what happens is, is that people, I mean, I remember friends used to say, I quit smoking on a daily basis, right? And so <laughs> it's very, very common. It's a very, very hard addiction, but yeah. but, but you can actually, if you're going to read, if you, if you identify yourself as a smoker, right? How do I, how do I decouple that identity? You know, it, it may be these medicines that help people to rebuild themselves and change their perception of who they are. Right. And, and I think that's I think that's probably the secret sauce behind behind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very exciting. And so we have our FDA meeting, our pre end meeting coming up next week. And and hopefully we'll, we'll go the next steps and, and get some medicine into some smokers, you know, within the next few months. Wow. Well, Rakesh, hey, congratulations and yeah. on all your, your past success. I mean, you have helped out so many people in in such uh, profound ways that you probably don't see the the uh, you know the final impact of that, but you're you're doing amazing work in, in that space and, and God knows that a lot of people need um help in the in the space uh with everything that's gone on. So uh, congratulations to you and you definitely are a game changer and uh, look out for the Midas and Innovations group as well. Guys, make sure to subscribe to this channel. There's impactful commentary, just like you heard now. If you love this, please share it with somebody who needs to hear it because you could be the game changer in their lives. Thank you guys and we'll see you next week. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable, so I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it. You may end up being the game changer in their lives.